I'm Matthew Bunn. I'm the James Schlesinger Professor of Energy, National Security, and Foreign Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I lead the Schools Managing the Atom Project, which is the hub of nuclear policy research at Harvard. Today, we're going to talk about some of the work you do related to the spread of nuclear weapons. So to begin, um, I was wondering what evolving technologies, so you've written about hypersonic missiles, military applications of artificial intelligence, which I'm sure is something that you're studying in detail at the moment, lethal autonomous weapons, military biotech, et cetera. Um, do you see as becoming the most significant in the next few years? Well, it depends on what part of significant uh, you mean. I think artificial intelligence is going to change everything about how we do most things in the world, whether it's work, play, study, uh, what have you. Uh, and I think it will change a lot of things about how wars are fought as well. Um, if you think about uh, the how non-nuclear evolving and disruptive technologies may affect the risk that nuclear weapons would actually be used in war, um, I think there's a variety of technologies, whether it's cyber, artificial intelligence, precision conventional weapons that can pose threats to nuclear targets uh, and other kinds of strategic impacts, uh, space and counter space uh, that are affecting those risks. And so it has always been the case that nuclear war would be most likely to arise out of some non-nuclear conflict. And so you had to think about how non-nuclear conflicts are fought in order to think about nuclear risk in a coherent way. But that's becoming even more true as more technologies that are non-nuclear affect nuclear balances. Mm. That's so interesting. Um, so can you tell us, what is the 2010 New START Treaty? Um, and that's expiring in two years. Um, so sort of what do you see as happening with renegotiations? So for over half a century now, uh, the nuclear forces of the largest nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, have been limited by arms control treaties. Right now, almost all of those arms control treaties have collapsed. Uh, the United States has withdrawn from some of them, in some cases in response to Russian violations. Um, others have expired. Uh, and so the last remaining treaty that limits the size of the nuclear forces of the biggest nuclear powers is the New START Treaty, which was signed uh, back when uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev was president of Russia um, and uh, Barack Obama was president of the United States in 2010. Uh, and it expires in February of 2026. Uh, and there are no talks underway right now because of the intense hostility between the United States and Russian governments uh, to replace that agreement. So it is quite possible that in 2026, for the first time in half a century, we'll be in a world with a completely unconstrained nuclear arms competition. So there are a web of other agreements none of which limit the size of these nuclear arsenals. For example, there is a uh, global treaty on the spread of nuclear weapons to additional states called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that is sort of the foundation of the effort to stem the spread of nuclear weapons so that, you, so that we don't have more fingers on the nuclear button. Uh, there is a global treaty that uh, prohibits nuclear testing uh, unfortunately, uh, the United States has never ratified uh, that treaty, although it has signed it. Uh, Russia ratified the treaty and then recently de-ratified it just to uh, uh, be sort of parallel with the United States and as a sign of its anger at the United States on nuclear issues. Mm. Well, that's frightening. Um, so. What steps, I mean, generally, this is, you know, such a broad question, obviously, but do you think um, could be or should be taken to sort of reduce tensions between the U.S. and Russia, but then also, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, um, you know, most of the, the well-armed states at the moment? 
Well, right now we have a, a really changing geopolitical situation where China's expanding strength is really affecting American thinking about both its non-nuclear military forces and what it needs and its nuclear forces and what are needed for those. In the old days, uh, the United States used to think about nuclear deterrence uh, in terms of what was needed to deter Russia. And if we had enough for them, then China was sort of a lesser included case. Now China's nuclear forces are growing at a rapid pace and within a decade are expected to be uh, roughly comparable to the size of U.S. strategic forces, although not yet comparable to the size of all the nuclear weapons the United States has, because there's a bunch of nuclear weapons in the United States that are kept as a, as a hedge. They aren't really ready for immediate use. There's a bunch more that are awaiting dismantlement. Um, so if you look at the total number of nuclear weapons that physically exist in the United States, it's way bigger than even where China will be in a decade. But if you look at the ones that are actually available for use on the large strategic scale, it'll be quite comparable to where China will be uh, in a decade. Um, and so people in the United States in the nuclear weapons establishment are now no longer thinking, well, what does the next round of nuclear arms reductions look like? They're thinking about, do we need to build up further compared to where we are now in order to meet the threats from Russia and China? It's my view, though, that we do not need to uh, additional nuclear weapons. We already have over 1,500 nuclear weapons uh, in the strategic arsenal ready to go. Uh, that is far more than is needed to convince states not to attack us or our immediate allies. Hmm. So what are launch on warning policies? So the United States maintains an option, uh, although it is not the only option available, uh, to launch nuclear forces on warning of an attack. Uh, we have uh, multiple ways of understanding whether an attack is happening. There are uh, satellites that use infrared sensors to detect the heat of rockets being launched from anywhere on Earth. Uh, and then we use what's called dual phenomenology. So you wanna have at least, at least two different kinds of sensors that are telling you an attack is happening rather than relying on just one. And so the United States also has um, early warning radars uh, that once a missile came over the curve of the Earth, the radars would pick it up and be able to uh, see it coming. And then the president, uh, if he or she wanted to implement a launch on warning approach, uh, would have only a couple of minutes to make decisions. And my own view is that decisions involving the potential death of tens of millions of human beings should never be made in a matter of a few minutes. That the United States, in my view, should plan on slow retaliation, not retaliation while missiles are still in the air. There's just too much room for error uh, if you're making those immediate decisions. I mean, it is certainly possible, both for the United States and for Russia, that the president might be drunk. The president might be in the middle of a massive fight with his or her spouse. Uh, you know, the president, all sorts of things could happen. Uh, and so I believe countries really ought to prepare for delayed response, not launch on warning. Yeah. And just one last question. Um, how do you think the West can or should restore European security um, after the, the war in Ukraine? What do you think the U.S.'s role in that is, if anything? So that's a big and difficult <laughs> question that uh, many in Europe are thinking about. And of course, it relates to the ongoing election in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, Donald Trump has made it very clear that he's not especially enthusiastic about NATO and has said publicly that if countries weren't 
paying uh, as much money for their own defense as he thinks they should, uh, he would not be willing to defend them. Um, I, I do think my guess is that the United States will remain in NATO. NATO will remain an important defensive alliance. It is the most powerful military alliance that has ever existed in human history. Um, what I hope will happen is that we will find some honorable way to settle the Ukraine war in the not too distant future. After all, every day it goes on, more people die, more people suffer, and the risk of nuclear war is higher than it would be otherwise. And then that we build structures of European security that allow the countries of Europe to feel protected from Russia, but also allow Russia to feel secure because otherwise Russia is gonna keep lashing out. If it continues to believe that it needs a buffer state of countries that it controls all around its borders, those countries are gonna be suffering. Uh, and so we need to find some way where all of the relevant states can feel secure. And part of that may be the war in Ukraine seems to suggest that defense in the current state of technology is easier than offensive invasion. When you try to move a huge force of tanks and armored personnel carriers forward with drones flying all over the place, seeing your every move and precision artillery available to blast you, both the Russians and the Ukrainians have found that very difficult to mount a successful offensive. Uh, and that suggests that you may be able to design military forces that are excellent in defense and poor at offensive invasion. And that might allow countries to feel more secure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.